Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are talking with Tim Dunn, author of Yellow Balloons, Power for Living Life Above the Circumstances. Tim was born and raised in the oral rich plains of West Texas. He learned the value of hard work at an early age from a father who worked as a farmer and factory worker during the trying and uncertain days of the Great Depression and World War II. Tim is the CEO of Crown Quest Operating Company. Among his active leadership roles, Tim is a board member of Grace School of Theology and Citizens for Self-Governance, chairman of the board for Empower Texans, Texans for Fiscal Responsibility, and the King's College in New York City, and vice chairman of the board of directors at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and First Liberty Institute. Tim and Terry continue to make their home in Midland, Texas, where, the proud, where they are the proud parents of six children and 15 grandchildren. You can follow uh, the story of Yellow Balloons at www.yellowballoons.net. Tim Dunn, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tim, the story is truly the incredible story of uh, uh, tragedy of the loss of your two and a half year old, 22 month old, uh, yeah. precious granddaughter whose heart stopped beating. Yeah. And the story of, uh, it's a memorial, it's a testimony. Yeah. And in order for you to be a man of this kind of resolve to share publicly, uh, this family, uh, story and legacy tragedy. uh say that again tragedy Tra yeah. tragedy mm -hmm. uh there has to be something in you birthed long ago long before the moment of discovery that when you draw upon our response it comes from not an instinctive place which would be uh fall to my knees in in sheer despair, uh, but come through this with a message of hope and a message of power and a message of life. There had to be something in you, either poured into you, uh, taught to you, trained up in you, that became your own so that you could be the man who is as accomplished and as faithful as you are today to give glory and honor to God, even in the worst of circumstances? Well, yes, thank you. Uh, that is the fact. Um, and really, there's two eras, I think, of that uh, story. One is my childhood and early adulthood, where you know, I, I was raised in a Christian home, and my parents were, um, I think, fantastic role models. Uh, they certainly were not perfect, far from it. Uh, but, you know, I think they took the heritage that they were given and added to it. And that's really all we can do, right? Nobody's going to have a perfect parent. Nobody's going to be a perfect parent. Uh, but they, 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 I think they gave me a good foundation. And then, and then in my early adulthood, I have uh, the blessing to be a gifted person at accomplishing things. You know, I'm a, uh, I became an executive in the oil business at age 27. So I, I had a meteoric rise and thought I was pretty cool. I mean, to be real frank, uh, I mean, um, I looked around me and thought that I was head and shoulders above most people. And then I encountered an experience that I think you might look at or the average person might look at and say, what's the big deal? But this was about 20 years ago, and I had a business failure. It, it, it grew out of a dispute I had with a, a friend of mine. He's still a friend. But in the course of that dispute, he told me, you know, people really think you're an arrogant person. You just stomp on people to get stuff done. And I reflected on that and figured out and found that, you know, he's really right. And my own image of myself was as a very respectable moral person who who followed all the rules and did all the things that they told us were the right things to do and so i was a good person but you know what romans says in uh, chapter seven is in my flesh that is in my core nature there's no good thing dwelling 
I had read that. I believed it was true. It was not really something that I had ingested as a reality about myself. And so I went through a period of self-examination to just realize how dragonish my own behavior was. And, you know, not, nothing immoral, nothing. I mean, this is not a, I was in drugs and uh, got off of drugs. This is a, I came face to face with the reality that I am an arrogant selfaholic in my base nature. And I was not put as crucifying that base nature daily. I was defending and rationalizing that base nature with my morality. And I, I went through a period of about a two year depression going through that. It was a excruciating, terrible time for me. External, everything was great. I was getting to do some of my, fulfilling some of my life dreams. But, you know, a lot of times when you say, so-and-so will make me happy, and you get there, you realize it's not true, right? And that happened to me. And so out of this period of self-examination, I got to be really good friends with Job. So he's one of my best buddies, Job. And it was through the experience of actually becoming like I am Job, not, not in his righteousness. His righteousness exceeds mine dramatically. Not in his circumstances. What he went through is 100 times worse than what I went through. But in coming to the point that he came to of saying, I am vile, because I was seeing myself not in comparison to other people, but in comparison to God and looking at my base nature. And I think because of that, I really came to the end of myself and started a new journey with Christ. And I realized out of that time with Job that this life is a tiny little speck of time in comparison to all the time we're going to have to exist. Tiny little speck, two minute light, wisp of vapor, James calls it. And that time is the only time we will have, the only time we will have to know God by faith. And so when Mariah died, I had been living for about 20 years this reality that everything that comes into my life is an opportunity to know God by faith. The good, the bad, the routine, it's all there to know God by faith. And this is just my one shot to get it. Three great things, faith, hope, and love. Only love remains. Why? You can't believe what you see. You see it. Well, faith is not going to happen in heaven. You can't. You can't hope for what you have. We're going to have it in heaven. So when we got to the point of Mariah's death, I mean, grief is grief. I still grieve over Mariah. The hole in my heart will never be uh, filled this side of uh, glory. But it's not all I have. I can look at this as a part of a whole. That This is a trial, but it's not me. And so I think, I think that was the main thing foundation I had to deal with Mariah's circumstances. When you were going through this difficulty, this uh, time of trial and circumstance, what was Terry, your, your helpmate, your, your, your mm-hmm. wife, when, when you went to her and you said, um, honey, you know, my partner just told me that I was an arrogant, self-serving, uh, I'm sure that she wanted to comfort you, but was she the, uh, the straight shooter that said to you, well, um, maybe you ought to think about that? Uh, my wife is uh, an incredible helper. She's, um, she is a, a tremendous part of my stability. And what, she has a tremendous gift of uh, supporting and while being truthful, okay? She, she was there for me. I always know Terry's going to be in my corner 100% of the time, but she is not an enabler. So when I need to hear, yes, that's right, I hear that, but I always hear it in an incredibly gracious way. It, 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 you know, and one of the things that God told Adam was, uh, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. It's not good for you to be alone. And we as males tend to think we're okay by ourselves, don't we? But it's not good for us to be alone. And I know that really firsthand because Terry was an immense part of my healing. But this was something I had to come to grips with on my own. I mean, it was, it was my problem. It wasn't her problem. And, you know, it's interesting because 
when I went through the difficulty with Mariah, which is I'm still going through, it wasn't something I caused. There was there was something that made it way worse in a way uh, that because I created the problem and it was the failure that I did. I mean, grief is what I deal with with Mariah. It was failure that I was dealing with with my Job experience. And for someone who's a highly accomplished person, failure can be an amazingly uh, debilitating. When you get to the book of Job, you hope that uh, in the last chapter somewhere, God's going to tell us why this happened. He's going to give us the reason, and Job, I'm sure, was hungry to know why me. Why, what did I ever do? And yet we don't find, uh, we don't get the satisfaction of closure on that. We just get that, uh, you know, he received a double portion for his trouble and um, we then turn the page and it's a new book of the Bible. Uh, there is a, a season of sifting and pressing and if you look back, uh, you can see that the preparation and the refinement was probably God preparing you to be the man that you would be at the time of Mariah's passing. Uh, and had you not had that experience, there might have been a different response system than the response that you gave at that time. Well, I think that's a fact, uh, but there's so much more. Uh, I've been privileged to be a part of building a number of different organizations. And one of the things I learned out of my Job-like experience was that I wanted to feel like I was in control, but I didn't really want to take responsibility. And I had the mistaken idea that leadership is being in charge. And that's not leadership the way God uh, defines it. Leadership is not being in charge. Leadership is taking responsibility. And one of the, one of the big points that I make in, in Yellow Balloons, which, which is a book about how to choose a true perspective and the power that that gives you dealing with circumstances. One of the big points I make is there's really only three things we control in life. Only three. We control who we trust. We get to choose that. God doesn't impose himself on us. We get to choose who we trust. We get to choose what we do, the actions we take, including what we dwell on. But we also get to choose how we look at things. Is this circumstance an attack on me or an opportunity? Now we get to, we get to choose that. And it's that third thing that kind of is going to set the table for who we trust and what we do. And even though we only control those three things, limited to those three things, and everything else is outside our control, what, what you choose, what everybody else chooses, all the circumstances in my life, except the ones I take direct action on, even those are out of my control in reality, those three things that I choose totally affect eternity. I mean, look at Job. God doesn't spell out for us what, what the answer to Job, but I think there's some important clues. James tell us, tells us that God meant it for good. And it's clear from the book of Job that Job was God's favorite guy. I mean, he's trash talking Satan, telling him, look, look at my servant Job. He's making you look so bad. He, he's elevating Job up and saying, this guy is fantastic. And so you have to ask your God, well, God, how come you let your fantastic guy get trashed? And I pondered that and pondered that. And I think there's a clue inside of Job because God is talking to the angels. There's a couple of verses. One says that angels long to peer into what we're doing. And that word that's used there is like an archaeologist studying an artifact. Got it. So uh, that's kind of weird. Why are the angels studying us? And then there's Ephesians 3.10, and it says the manifold wisdom of God is revealed by the church to who? Who does the church reveal the manifold wisdom of God to? Well, when I ask that question to people, they usually say, uh, well, believers, uh, well, unbelievers. No, here it is. The manifold wisdom of God is revealed by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 
and, and I started thinking about Job and this, you know, thing going on in heaven between God and Satan and this book, this verse, Ephesians 3.10, that says, well, wait a minute. Where have the principalities and powers been? They've been in heaven. They see God. God has taught them himself. God's not an inadequate teacher. They've been there for eons of time. Why are they watching us to understand God? And then it kind of dawned on me that the one thing we can do that they can't do and never will be able to do is know God by faith. And I think, I think the part of the message of Job is that God did not want his favorite guy to miss out on any, however small, opportunity to know God by faith. Uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 4, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has even entered into the thoughts of man what God has in store for those who love him. So it's somewhere beyond our grasp how in the world all this difficulty could actually be an enormous benefit for us. But it's right there. It's plain as day. It is. I don't understand it. I do believe it. And I, be I have experienced it. Out of that terrible time of my Job experience, my first Job experience, came the understanding of what leadership is. And I have had the privilege of leading a lot of organizations in a way of saying, I will take responsibility and recognize I do not have control. And I, I don't think I would be have anywhere near the fulfillment today I would have had otherwise. And then when Mariah happened, I have a, some understanding of how to deal with that, although I didn't know how to deal with that kind of grief. I went out and immediately sought help from other people like, okay, grief can tear us apart. I know that. What do we do? And we got some fantastic counseling, you know, because I'm still learning. <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with that situation. And uh, thank, thank God for Grief Share, the right. tremendous program Grief Share. It helped us immensely. Take me back. Uh, we've got about three minutes in this segment, and it'll be a great segue into the rest of the story. But take me back to the afternoon of September 18th, 2015. Well, uh, our son, David, who's a musician, we have six children, five of them live in town with us, and we all work in the oil business together. And David was, uh, is, has an engineering degree. His brothers really tried to get him to come back and work with us because we needed the help really bad at the time. But he decided, you know, I need to do the music business. I don't want to look back on my life and wonder what could I have done. And so he went off with his guitar and his voice to try to make it in the music business. He was on a TV show called The Voice in the second season. He didn't win, but he wasn't deterred and he kept on going in his business. And he's now has a very successful career. David Dunn, he has an album out called Yellow Balloons. I copied his album for my book cover. We released Yellow Balloons into the air to say goodbye to Mariah. So we both had a tribute there. And he's on Christian radio. Uh, you probably know his songs if you don't know his name. Uh, but he had, been, had not been to town for like nine months, and he came to the city. And Mariah loved Uncle Days, is what she called him. And she, she would sing his song. His song it was on the radio at that time. It was called uh, Today is Beautiful. And she would sing the last word of the line, you know, die, lie, sky, because she couldn't really sing the whole song. And so she was really excited to get to see Dave. So Dave and I went over to Mary Catherine's house. And uh, she wasn't feeling good, though. And Mary Catherine said, I think she just needs a nap. Mary Catherine and Mariah and Tim uh, and uh, Wimberly had been, uh, and uh, Wheatley, I'm sorry, their last name's Wimberly, had been living with us for about nine months because they tried to buy a house, took some time. It was a hot market here. And then they bought something to remodel. And they were a couple weeks away from moving out. So Mary Catherine put Mariah down. Mariah had had some fever-induced seizures, and she had a small fever, so Mary Catherine was keeping a close eye on her. And she walked, look, went in to look at her, and she was blue. And she picked her up, and she wasn't breathing. And my wife had just come back from a walk, so she heard Mary Catherine screaming, went in, gave her CPR, got her uh, color back. The ambulance came. They're just a few blocks down from us. They just couldn't start her heart again. So, you know, she went from perfectly fine to not with us anymore. And there was an autopsy and no medical explanation. She just, she's just gone. 
22-month-old Mariah Constance Wiverly. Yes. Her heart would stop beating on September 18, 2015. It would be out of this unimaginable anguish that a West Texas oil man and his family would never view life the same way again. Right. And in yellow balloons, power for living above the circumstances, this memorial and testimony to Mariah's young life and how each of us can be blessed and empowered to live above the agonies, the drudgeries, and the mountaintops of our two-minute ride here on Earth. When we come back from break, we're going to talk to Tim about life in two-minute segments and what that means and how he is able today to publish a book, his son publish a uh, CD uh, in tribute to the precious memory of a 22-year-old that touched their lives and her story and the beautiful benefits of understanding the grace and the mercy of God even in tragedy will be revealed to you when we come right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatian Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The Teaching Archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, Prophecy in the News videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5th, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. 
We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Tim Dunn, author of Yellow Balloons, Power for Living Life Above the Circumstances. Tim, welcome back to the program. Thank you. To our audience, I want to tell you that Tim has just made a spectacular, very generous offer. For one week, if you visit yellowballoons.net, there's going to be a special offer there for you. And if you type in the word TRUTH, capital T, small letters, R-U-T-H, like revealing the truth, uh, you can get a free download of this book, Yellow Balloons. And Tim, why are you wanting to make this available for free? Authors usually are trying to sell books. Uh, why do you want to put it in the hands of so many? Well, I, writing this book was not an easy thing for me. I'm not a good writer. And I felt like God had given me a message and wanted me to share it. And one of the one of the things I learned in my Joe Black experience is I don't have much time here. It's a wisp of vapor. And this is the only opportunity I have to know God by faith. So I'm an investor. I drill oil wells. Uh, we do a lot of other kinds of investments. I understand the nature of good investments. And what God tells us is that if we will invest in his kingdom, he guarantees us a hundred to one investment. Now, I'm not sure what that means mathematically, Eric, but I can tell you this. Today, you can buy a treasury bill, a 30-year treasury bill at about 3%. You'll get about two and a half times your money back on that. If you get 100 times your money back on a treasury bill, that's like a 17% rate of return. That's unheard of. And it may mean that God meant 100% rate of return, which means you'd be a billion times your money back. And I don't think God's really given us a monetary message. What he's trying to convey to us is we can't really comprehend the return he will give us if we will give even a cup of cold water in his name. So we're, we're asked to be stewards and share with others what we do have, not what we don't have. And it's comparatively easy for me to give dollar donations, although it's hard to give money to people and not harm them. But it's really uh, simple to give away uh, understanding. And I just felt like God had given me some insight into something I needed to share it with people. And that's why I wrote the book. So I could care less if I, I, how much money I make out off of it. I would love it if everybody out there would download it and tell 15 of their friends and break the bank on these free downloads. If you go to yellowballoons.net, there's a balloon that says free downloads. Click that free downloads, put, put in truth, and you should be able to get a download. The Kindle version has a little bit of, of a quirk to it. You can't download directly onto the Kindle device. You have to use the Kindle app. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Should be a blessing to so many. You know, we share the same philosophy you do. We don't sell advertising. We are the only Christian network that does not have advertisers. So how do we operate a global television network uh, broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, pro programming like this around the globe uh, without charging for commercial times or sponsorships? And that is because uh, we can't outgive God. You can't outserve God. Uh, I was called to preach the gospel to the four corners of the earth. I was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles as a 
Jewish believer, and this was the medium that God provided, and he provided all of it uh, for us to be able to reach. And like I said, this is about the thousand and 30th episode of this program that airs around the world with hundreds of thousands of views all the time uh, to an audience that's in the millions. And so we're delighted to find a like-minded believer that says, you know what, it wasn't yours to begin with. You can't take it with you. That's and right. in your case, you actually say our lives on earth are is a two minute ride. Tell me what that means. Well, we went to Disneyland with our kids, and we went through the Snow White's Scary Adventures. Mm -hmm. And we had some, like, really little kids and some pretty little kids, and about half of them cried, and the other half enjoyed it. And I asked the attendant there, How, what, what's the ratio of kids that come out of here crying? He said, oh, it's about half. So it turns out our kids were about the same. And, you know, it got me thinking about how that's so much like our life here on earth. Uh, James says our life is comparatively a wisp of vapor. So we're going to exist from now on, right? It's an eternity past and an eternity before and a tiny little speck of time in between. So the question then is what is so significant about this speck of time? And the answer I think is this is when we can know God by faith. This is when we can serve one another by faith. Uh, this is when we can do things believing that God's going to make it right and that it'll be uh, good for us, but not knowing it and not seeing it. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. And so maybe all your listeners ought to download a copy of uh, uh, Yellow Balloons and then the seven or ten dollars they would have spent, send it to Revealing the Truth. How about that? That'd be a good trap. <laughs> uh, because when you bless other people, you are actually making an investment. So Jesus gave a parable that I don't think is very well understood. It's called the parable of the unrighteous steward. And Jesus is, is telling this parable to his disciples now, not to the general public, to his disciples. And he tells this story. He says that there was this man who was a steward and his master had, was very rich and so he was squandering his master's good. Somebody snitched on him. So the master called him in and said, hey, I heard, I heard that you're pilfering my goods. I'm going to get you audited. And if you don't pass the audit, I'm going to fire you. So the guy went away. He knows he's going to be caught. So he's got a very limited time. So he says, man, I'm too weak to dig. I'm too ashamed to beg. What am I going to do? I got it. I know what I'm going to do. And this is the key phrase to understand the parable. That they may receive me into their homes. So he goes out and he says, how much do you owe my master? 80, barrel, 80 barrels of oil. Oh, sit down and write 50. How much do you owe my master? 100 bushels a week. Sit down and write 50. That they may receive me into their homes. He's feathering his own nest by giving away someone else's money so he can benefit. So the parable ends and Jesus says, so the master commended the unrighteous steward. And then the parable ends. And you think, well, golly, the hero in this parable is a guy who's a thief uh, no, no, Jesus isn't commending him for being a thief. He's commending him for being shrewd. And then he gives the answer to the, to the disciples. He says, therefore, make for yourself friends with unrighteous money, my money, because he's the master, right? That they may receive you into an eternal home. Well, look at that. I would like to be on a lot of invitation lists to cool parties in heaven, wouldn't you? When we get to the new earth, I would like to have a lot of friends that I helped in this life. And he's saying, look, use my money. It's all mine. I'm happy for you to use my money to benefit other people. And then when you get there to heaven, part of your reward is going to be from them. And he, he tells the disciples, the sons of this age are way more shrewd than the sons of light are because I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I mean, go to any state capital or the Washington, D.C., you get that, right? You can see the, the sons of this generation understand that. You need to understand that. So after I understood that principle, I'm always looking for an opportunity to actually bless other people. Uh, it's not always easy to do, but that's my eternal investment portfolio. In this 
tragedy that uh, you went through with your family and the writing of Yellow Balloons, uh, this book is more than just about how to survive or thrive or heal from tragedy. There's, right. there's kind of a bigger message in here that uh, if, if people didn't know it, they might think that this is a grief support book, but it's much more than a grief support book. That's right. It's really a book about choosing a perspective. So it starts off with tremendous grief because when, when tragedy happens, you have to choose a perspective. But most of the book is actually about what you do in the everyday life and on the mountaintops, because there's really three terrains of life. There's the valley, and there's the mountaintops, and we tend to think about those the most, but most of life happens on the plains, everyday life. And we tend to think that those times don't matter that much and that we don't matter that much. All the important people are the ones that we see on the CBS news, or the important people are the ones that are famous. Mm -mm, no, no, not at all. The important people are the ones who will do what God has given them to do faithfully. And it doesn't matter what the world thinks of that. The widow's might. Nobody thought she was a famous person, but we all know about her because Jesus said, hey, there's a famous person right there. Look at that person. She gave a penny. We're going to celebrate that in heaven. Look all the fantastic things she did. A penny? That's significant? Yes, because she was doing with what she had. So changing diapers, caring for an elder, elderly parent in patience and graciously, in truth, those are heroic activities. Think about Abraham. What did he do that was so heroic? He moved. He believed God that he was going to have a kid. If you would have been living in his house, you wouldn't have seen anything that looked heroic. That all happened in his heart. And God knows the heart. And so when we believe God and live that in everyday life and choose the perspective that that's what we're here for, and that's, what our, that's how we can have the desires God gave us fulfilled, we are doing something heroic. You know, Abraham is a faith superhero. I don't think the people at his time had any idea he was a faith superhero. If we live in a way that we are doing with what God gave us, what he asks us to do, that's heroic. And we are like a Peter Parker or a Cinderella. We, the world looks at us like we're nothing. That's not the way God looks at us. So it's really about choosing a perspective on all of our activities that if we go about it the way God asks us to, it's heroic. And if we don't, we're squandering an enormous opportunity that will never, ever come again. This is our only chance to know God by faith. And that's the idea of the two minute ride. We have it and then it's over. And if we'll maintain our perspective throughout the ride, it can be fun and enjoyable. And if we don't maintain our perspective, we just come out the other end crying. You know, we wasted it. You bring up that we need to embrace our inner superhero, that, that uh, what Abraham did was when God said, I'm going to send you a place you've never been to. You're going to be a stranger in a strange land. And he goes, okay, honey, we're pack the bags, we're moving. Uh, there's no questioning, it's just obedience. Noah, uh, no questioning, just pure obedience. Hearing from the Lord and obeying. Hear and obey, hear and obey, hear and obey is what defines the superhero in all of us is we have the written word of God, uh, we have it available to us, but if, if we're just hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then we become our own kryptonite. We become our own self-defeating right. prophecy. We become feeding on the poison of despair or the poison of negativity or the poison, and we cannot blame that on another. Uh, it takes iron sharpening iron, iron, your partner coming to you and saying you're arrogant. That's yeah. an iron sharpening iron. But, but the beauty of the iron upon iron picture is that the sparks fly and the sparks fly and hit other people. And other people get ignited in this process. That's what starts a fire as a spark. And so the, 
the uh, fallout, if you will, is that everybody in your life that you impacted as an arrogant person was now going to be impacted by a compassionate person. And that is going to increase the magnitude of the impact of that encounter. And you take that same theme and you take this tragedy uh, with your granddaughter and you say there's something even more important, more difficult, much larger than not to minimize or trivialize the, the, the passing of this precious uh, baby girl, but that there is something bigger than just surviving and thriving in the loss of a loved one. And you want, uh, and I think as much to tell the story to honor the memory of Mariah Constance Wormberley as you do to say, wake up people, there's something bigger lying ahead that is waiting or even you might be in that's bigger than what I had to go through. And I want to prepare you and equip you to rise up and take charge of that. Uh, what is that? Well, you know, um, you're, right, you're right on there. The, the best way to honor Mariah is to keep on living. And the way to keep on living is to live in faith. Now, I, I say I am an arrogant person, not I was an arrogant person, because my flesh is still there. And I, get, I, I still choose it more often than I should, because that's another choice we get to make, right? We get to make whether to, a choice to walk in the spirit, walk in the flesh. And when I walk in the flesh, I am giving in to two things. I'm giving in to the illusion that I control things. You know, idolatry is basically who can I get to give me what I want? You know, how much do I have to give the power to get what I want? It's ultimately me in control. And most of my problems like fits of rage and, and uh, anger and things like, it's me trying to control things I can't control. And the other thing that my flesh gets me is addictions. You know, it's some kind of appetite. And if I chase that appetite, the appetite ends up controlling me, not me controlling it. Mm. Uh, so that's what I get with the flesh. And I still have that battle, but I know I have the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, which would you rather have, being from Krypton or being bit by a radioactive spider or, or the power of the living God within us? And I think a lot of what we do is we just minimize the reality that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And it's constantly has a passionate desire for us. Galatians 5 tell us, the, excuse me, the spirit lusts against the flesh, the spirit the flesh lusts against the spirit. That that word lust is translated in Luke uh, 22 when Jesus said, I passionately desire to have the last supper with you. It's a passionate desire. And the spirit so wants us to choose it. Why? Because it will lead us to green pastures. It will lead us to a, a banquet in the face of our enemies. It will lead us to our best benefit, even though it may not feel like it at the time. So when we have a tragedy like Mariah, it can be a building block for everyday life because when the tragedy's over, every day starts again. And it is heroic to do everyday activities as unto the Lord. I don't know, did you ever read a, a, a Brother Lawrence's books, the, 15, the 1600s uh, um, French monastery kitchen worker? Have you ever read his works? No, unfortunately in the work that I do, I read three books a day. 700 books a year, and uh, the idea of reading for pleasure, uh, quite honestly, is, um, I hate to admit this, is to not to read, because this, I'm a talk show host that interviews three authors a day, five days a week, and, and I actually read every one of their books. Good for uh, you. I have 1,500 books on a dolly right now that are going to a women's intake center we recycle all these back oh, into right. various communities that we take the books that are sent to us and give them to various ministries. But uh, I'll save I'll save you the trouble, Brother Lawrence. <laughs> Brother Lawrence was a, a a kitchen worker in a monastery. Never wrote a book. 
he's so impacted so many people and talking to him that they wrote books and they're still in prints 400 years later. And his basic theme was, or the, his basic experience was he came as a 50 year old guy and decided he was going to serve the Lord by doing something he didn't particularly like, which was to do kitchen tasks. And he did them in communion with God, washing pots. And he did the pots, pot washing as unto the Lord. And it was so remarkable to people that came all over to see what was going on. Well, that's, that's the opportunity we have to actually say, I'm so thankful I get to change this diaper. I'm so thankful that I get to wipe this snotty nose again. I'm so grateful I get to write this expense report again. I'm doing this as under the Lord. You say, well, that sounds weird and crazy. Well, yeah, but Colossians 3.23 says uh, to us, whatever you do, that's a broad name, <laughs> whatever you do, do mm -hmm. as unto the Lord, for it is from him you will receive the reward of the inheritance. And that big part of that reward is that foxhole relationship of serving in battle alongside the people who you're trusting your lives alongside, like those veterans who have a bond that can't be shared with anyone else. When we do that life with one another as unto the Lord, and when we do life with God as unto him, I think that's going to be the greatest reward that we get when we get to the other side. Is he the one that said that you should constantly <laughs> preach the gospel and if you have to use words? That was St. Anselm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, not Anselm. St. Francis, I'm Saint sorry. St. Francis of Francis Assisi. Francis of Assisi, yeah. Okay. You I, I, preach I, the gospel at all times. If, ne if necessary, use words. Right. But I think they're, they're, you know, they have the same basic idea. It's in the living. Yes. You know, God is in your hands. And it's in the living that, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever done this. I searched the New Testament to see how many times the, the, the epistles tell us to share our faith verbally. You know how many times I found? One. It's in 1 Peter 3, and it says, when somebody asks you, why are you so happy when you're suffering persecution unjustly? Be ready to give a defense of the gospel that's within you. But, you know, on every page of the epistles, every page it tells you, Live your faith. Live the reality of your faith where everybody can see it. Tim, so, Tim, one of the takeaway messages from the book, and you have it in your discussion point, is that if you in our audience are struggling with something that there's a story to be shared and you're uncomfortable sharing it, but it bubbles up inside of you and it could be the blessing that someone needs, the word of encouragement that someone needs to get through something you've gone through. Uh, I've talked about the fact that uh, I failed in business in 1980 and was homeless for two years. Uh, I talk about the fact that the rug was pulled out from under my life through a betrayal and I had to completely reframe my life at 61 years old into a new ministry and a new calling, but God wasn't done with me and I've openly shared that in books and in interviews and conversations, not that I'm proud, but because there's others out there that think that they can't start life over again at 62, that they are, their life is finished and that they will be relegated to living in a mobile home and trying to draw Social Security and not be able to accomplish anything. Now that I approach 67 and the Lord has given us this global ministry to share these intimate stories, these heart lines that are so touching and so compelling that it provokes you to say, you know what, I've been through something and I have a story to tell. The Word of God says that you, my friends, are overcomers by the word of your testimony. If you don't share that word, if you don't give that word, then you keep it private and personal and it's not glorifying and edifying to God. God says, let your light so shine that man would see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. It can only be through the overcoming of circumstances, the trials of life that each one of us are going to face. It doesn't have to be as tragic as the death and the passing of this precious baby, due to no fault of anyone, but to the sovereignty of God that he called her home when he did, and the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Join in faith and join in hope with Tim Dunn as he tells the story that is grief riddled, pages with tears on them, as he wrote this because it was too painful 
to keep inside and not to share because he had you in mind when he was writing it. He didn't have himself. He wanted to give you the tools to get out of your prison, to break forth, to embrace that superhero, to find a way to go through life with a new perspective and choose which path you will take. Will it be the path of the resurrected life even in the death of a child, the resurrected life that Jesus died for to give to you. And yet he's giving you a copy of this. Visit yellowballoons.net. There's going to be a balloon that says free download. Click on that free download. Type in the word T-R-U-T-H, truth with a capital T, and you'll get a free e-book of this. He's not asking you for your money. He's saying spread the word and impact other people's lives. One widow's might at a time. Tim Dunn, thank you so much for sharing your story here on thank Revealing you, the Truth. God bless you, my friend. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 